Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Jack Meyer. Dr. Meyer is an endocrinology specialist in Fremont, California. He graduated from University of California San Francisco School of Medicine and has been practicing medicine for over 40 years. I'm going to be talking about living with diabetes, a patient perspective, which all of you can uh, identify with. And uh, there are some, a few points that I want to make uh, at the outset. The first is that knowledge is power. The more you know about the diabetes, the more you'll be able to take care of it. A second point is that diabetes is a disease without an illness. And there are a number of implications about that. First of all, no one's going to give you any slack because you look perfectly well, especially if you're taking care of your diabetes in a proper manner. I tell my patients, you don't have lumps in your breast when you have diabetes. You don't vomit blood when you have diabetes. You don't have a stroke when you have diabetes. It's pretty invisible. It's sort of like, I imagine a duck. The duck is just sort of on the water, kind of floating along seamlessly, and no one realizes how furiously he, he's paddling beneath the surface. And you know what that means, uh, testing the blood sugar, watching what you're eating, being careful. Uh, a third fact that I, I want to say at the outset is that diabetes is uh, one of the chronic illnesses. It doesn't go away. We don't know how to cure it, really. And it demands an awful lot of work. We ask you to do an awful lot of things. It's like having a part-time job. Of all the, of all the chronic diseases, it's the one I think that demands the most as far as patient uh, income and work. I mean, if you have heart trouble, uh, you watch what you eat, but that's pretty much it. You take a few pills. If you've had a surgery, a gallbladder operation, uh, it hurts for a while, and then after that you uh, avoid certain foods, and that's uh, pretty much it. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have aches and pains, but you take the pills and they they work more or less. Psoriasis, you take the medicine and it's either successful or not. But diabetes is a, a kind of a compact, a deal uh, that you make with the uh, healthcare provider in which he or she talks to you and actually asks you to do certain things and you have to try to be as, uh, as conscientious uh, as possible. There's an awful lot of guilt associated with diabetes. Diabetes is one of the, I think, rare illnesses where if you mess up, uh, uh, you can be made to feel guilty. I mean, if a person has a heart attack and then has a, another heart attack, no one in the family or the doctor is going to wave their mighty hand and say, shame on you, why don't you do better? The issue with diabetes is that it, it revolves so much uh, around food. Everybody has to eat. If one does addiction medicine, one uh, has to help the client or the patient deal with alcohol addiction or heroin addiction or cocaine, cocaine ad uh, addiction and uh, try to have the patient work very hard to stop these addictions. But with diabetes, everybody has to eat. There's no way not to get around the the, the, the basic focus of, of diabetic management, which is uh, uh, watching, uh, watching what you eat. Now, uh, what is diabetes? Uh, diabetes is a situation in which 
the level of sugar in the blood is too high. And that is caused by a relative or absolute lack of the hormone insulin. Now what's a hormone? The word hormone comes from Greek and means to rouse or set into motion. So insulin is a hormone that's made in the pancreas, which is uh, on the right side by your stomach. And the insulin goes through the blood and travels to a particular place to do a particular thing. That's what the hormone does. It goes from one part of the body through the blood to another part of the body to rouse into or set into motion a particular thing. Insulin acts like the key to the door of the cell as far as sugar is concerned so that it opens the door of the cell to let the sugar that's in the blood enter the cell where it belongs to be turned into energy and fuel and heat and fat. And if you don't have enough of the hormone insulin, the sugar level goes very high. Now, when we talk about diabetes with our diabetes teaching program, we want to be optimistic and give you information and motivation to take care of yourselves properly. Because if you do take care of yourself properly, you'll live about as long as anybody else. One of the uh, little techniques we use when we talk to medical students about diabetes we ask them the question, true or false? Diabetes is the number one cause of adult blindness and amputations and kidney failure. And all the bright students, they all raise their hands and say, yes, yes, yes. It's the number one cause of all these things. But in reality, it's not the number one cause of these bad things. Poorly controlled diabetes can lead to uh, the complications that are bad. A picture of these is uh, on the next slide. This is what can happen to you if you don't take care of your diabetes properly and bad things can occur. But they don't need to occur. Again, if your diabetes is well managed, you can, you can do just fine. So I want to allay fears that you might have of despair and discouragement that, oh my God, I've got diabetes, now, uh, now my life is over. It isn't. What's the game plan? The first is diet. Diet is the source of carbohydrates, which is the main source of sugars. So if you are able to manage these, the quantities, then the main reason for the sugars being up can be addressed. Now, the dietitians will talk to you about a general way to look at the foods that you eat and to be moderate in all, in all respects. We call it the diabetes portion plate in which about half of the plate is filled with vegetables, a quarter of the plate is filled with your starchy foods, protein another quarter of the plate, fats and oils. In the best world, it's nice to have some fruit or a half a cup of fruit salad, and to have milk is always a good idea. And so the goal of a diet in a person with diabetes is to moderate their caloric intake and especially watch their carbohydrates. Exercise is important. When a person exercises and has diabetes, the sugars uh, will be lower because exercise in and of itself helps to prevent the sugar from rising too much after a meal. Now this is a picture of myself early in the morning before I get all prepared for my day uh, and so I've changed my costume. But the idea is if you could see to do a little something every day before you start your day or after your day is completed, you're better off. I'm lucky, I live about 12 minutes from work, so what I do is I just walk to work every day and then walk home, and that gives me a little bit of exercise. Medications, there are lots of pills and potions to use as far as diabetes uh, management uh, is concerned. The way it works with diabetes is there is a natural history of progressive decline in the body's ability to make as much insulin as the body requires. So what pills and potions you take is predicated on where you are in the scheme of things, the natural history of diabetes. First, in a, in a 
type 2 diabetic, for instance, a diabetic that still makes some insulin, but not as much as he needs, maybe only watching the amount of calories that they take in. Diet can be sufficient, as well as exercise. But as time goes on, <coughs> diet alone is uh, not sufficient, and other medications uh, need to be used. And if the person lives long enough with his diabetes, oftentimes the pancreas uh, poops out completely as far as making insulin itself, and then insulin uh, must be added. Now, I wanted to have a little aside about insulin. A lot of people feel bad about taking insulin and what the meanings are uh, of being in the grip of taking insulin on a daily basis. A lot of people think that if I have to take insulin, somehow I have failed. Because if I were doing everything right, I wouldn't have to take these shots. But that's not correct. As time goes on, the ability of the pancreas to make as much insulin as is necessary just falters. And insulin is often required to make up the difference. So insulin should not be considered as your enemy, but as your friend. There comes a time at which insulin is the best treatment. And so you should take the insulin whenever uh, that situation occurs so that you can keep yourself in good, in good shape. But there's a lot of folklore about insulin. A lot of times, I had a patient in the office today, a lady, an uh, uh, Asian lady of 80, that should be on insulin. And she said, nope, I'm not going to take it. Because And then her, her daughter interpreted for me and said, when we know in our culture that when you take insulin, death is near. And then the grandson would say, I know all about insulin. My Aunt Martha was a type 2 diabetic, and she took insulin. She was blind. She had a foot that looked like the foot on the slide. Her kidneys had failed her. They started the shots, and six months later, she was dead. Insulin is death medicine, and I won't take it. Now the problem with that uh, analysis, it's false, is that the persons make uh, the conclusion that just because two events are related in time, it means that insulin number one is the cause of death and dismemberment and a, a bad outcome number two. Just because you take the insulin and six months later you pass on to your reward, does it mean that the starting of the insulin program caused it? Actually, from the doctor's perspective, the insulin should have been started years before when things were just beginning to falter. But oftentimes this isn't done because the patient says, tell me about it. All I have is a sad memory of Aunt Martha or the, the lady that I saw this afternoon at 4 o'clock. The daughter was more responsive to it, but not, not, uh, not the patient. So, what are the medications that we use? Various pills. And here they are, enough to uh, cause a person's eyes to uh, glaze over. But the idea about pills is something that we should talk a little bit. Pills and compliance. A lot of people have problems with the medications. Number one, with diabetes, there's a lot of different ones to consider. And uh, a lot of things come up. Some people don't follow directions. Some people take insulin at mealtime. They take it after the meal instead of before the meal, not realizing that when we give a person an insulin shot, it's designed to work like the body works itself. And when a person, a normal person, eats uh, meat and potatoes, the insulin is starting to squirt into the system right at the time they are beginning to eat, not after the meal is over. In other words, it's like closing the barn door after the cows have escaped. Timing is important. Now, it's better to take it after the meal than not take it at all, but it's best with mealtime insulin, for instance, to take it uh, before the meal. So incorrect timing is, is an issue. As far as insulin is concerned, 
the uh, insulin shot, when it's given, the sights have to be rotated. I have what I call the, the two-finger rule. Every insulin shot should be two fingers from the previous shot. So if you're taking a morning and evening insulin, this would be Monday morning, Monday evening, Tuesday morning, Tuesday evening, in a straight line across the abdomen. And each line should be two inches below the previous line. And you can start up high, and you can go down low as far as you dare, and can go over here as far as you reach. The two finger rule. And you should only do this on one side. And when that's all done, then you go to the other side and do the same thing. So what does this do? Well, what it does is it spreads the wealth. You're not giving the shot in the same place all the time. Because if you give it in the same place all the time, you can develop something called insulin lipohypertrophy, in which the flesh under the place where you give the shot kind of thickens and gets firm and, and lumpy and, and stands out. Have any of you experienced that uh, lipohypertrophy? Sure. I had a patient about 20 years ago. He was an Italian engineer, and he was a type 1 diabetic. And he was an engineer, so he was very meticulous and obedient. He followed orders. And he was taught at the start of his diabetic career that you rotate your sights, and what you do is you do a one shot here, one shot here, one shot here, one shot here, one shot there, and one shot there. And that's, that's rotation. And that's what he did. But the places that he sought for the purposes of discussion for his abdomen were always the same place. So when I saw him, he had trouble with his diabetes management that was partially due to difficulties with the absorption of the insulin. Now, I'm going to use a word picture here. I don't know if this will be appropriate or not, but I think so. Do any of you remember Studebaker's, 1952 Studebaker's? Thank you, young man. Is, am I drawing a blank from the rest of you? Well, a 1952 Studebaker in the Studebaker line up to about the Avanti in 1958 or 59 had these very prominent headlights in the front, sort of like boom, boom, and then the headlight on the end. So when this Italian gentleman exposed his abdomen, it looked like the front of a 1952 Studebaker. Each side was a teat of, of li lipohypertrophied, thickened skin that he religiously gave the insulin uh, into every, every fifth rotation for the previous 20 years without rotating. And as a result, uh, there was a scar tissue and swelling of the, of the fat uh, layer underneath the skin that interfered with proper absorption because he wasn't taught 30 years ago the two-finger rule. So this is the, one of the main things that you should uh, take away with you this evening. Other than optimism and hope, not being discouraged is the two-finger rule. Now, a lot of people don't take the medicine they're supposed to. They've done studies, and some people, they never fill the prescription. I had a lady a while ago. I thought she, sh she should take something for a men uh, menopausal lady, <clears throat> take something for, for hormone replacement. And she nodded yes uh, when she left the place and never filled it. She says, well, I thought about it. I decided I didn't want to do it. With diabetes, it's the same thing. You can give the person the medication, but they, <clears throat> the medications work a lot better in the stomach than in the bottle in, in, the, in the jar looking at you. So it's, uh, the idea is to get the patient to <coughs> work with you as far as uh, uh, taking their, their stuff. So... What we have to try to do, patient perspective, <clears throat> in the manage, as part of a, the management team, is to ex have an information exchange. The doctor team has knowledge about what he thinks would be good and judgment, what would be a good idea, but to work with the patient's preferences and priorities and values. We must respect the person's uh, fear of insulin because it can be cultural, it can be ingrained from <clears throat> sad family experiences. 
there are a lot of things that get in the way of taking the medications. <clears throat> I can't afford the medication. I can only afford to take half a pill, and I'm ashamed to tell the doctor about it. I mean, the doctor, all he does is just write medication. He doesn't have to buy anything. He just gives, uh, gives advice. I was going to say free advice, but of course, you know it's not free advice. <clears throat> and uh, the, sometimes the patient just can't do it. <clears throat> or they get side effects, or they're afraid they're going to get side effects. So there are various impediments uh, for the patient to follow the directions uh, that the health team want them to take. But we want to talk to the patient to make sure that they have some skin in the game so that they will be willing to do what is, what is good, have them buy into <clears throat> the medications that we discuss. <clears throat> the message tonight is don't be afraid of insulin. Insulin is your friend. When used properly and used soon enough, it can be an aid and a benefit to you on the long road to uh, uh, careful diabetic management. <clears throat> there are different kinds of insulin. The, the insulin can be given in a syringe and a vial like the old days in the black and white movies, or you can use insulin pens where it's easier <coughs> to give the insulin. One can use an insulin pump, which is a very good way to give insulin on a, on a continuous basis. Other injectables, um, those are include, including the GLP-1 agonists, they're called like <coughs> Victoza or Bidurion or Bieta or Trulicity or Tanzium. They're on TV all the time. They're a very good choice. And here's a gentleman giving his injection. And the point is, uh, my poor Italian gentleman did the same thing in the same way for 25 years and had a big lumpy abdomen. And I'm hoping that this fellow doesn't do the same. And you make sure that you don't do it you insulin users out there. Now, what we're trying to do with our diabetes is to have control of it. And there's a very helpful technique that was developed about, uh, in the late, uh, came out in, in the late 70s, <clears throat> called the hemoglobin A1C. What's the hemoglobin A1C? Has any of you heard that term, hemoglobin A1C? Do any of your doctors throw that term around? Well, it's, it's an important one. Uh, everyone has hemoglobin in their blood. <clears throat> it's in the red blood cells. It what, it's what makes the blood red. And if you didn't have it, you'd be dead. It carries the oxygen from the outside world into all your cells. Hemoglobin. Everyone has glucose in their blood. If you didn't, if glucose is the fuel for the cells of the body. <clears throat> if you didn't have that, you'd be dead. And what, and what happens is that hemoglobin lives in the red blood cell. And the red blood cell lives in the body, in the bloodstream, for about, well, 120 days on average. And it, what happens is that the sugar gets stuck to the hemoglobin to a degree. It's as if the red blood cells are marinating in this sea of, of sugar water. And when one looks at, at hemoglobin, and asks the question, the scientist asks the question, is this hemoglobin that I'm looking at, is it all pure hemoglobin or is some of it different? And they did a study where they look at it to see if it's all pure. And there's one little shoulder that comes off to the side that isn't hemoglobin, <clears throat> but instead is hemoglobin A1C. It's hemoglobin that has sugar stuck to it. <clears throat> and in the normal person, about 5% of the hemoglobin isn't hemoglobin, but it's hemoglobin A1C. And the wonderful thing that they discovered is that depending on how high above 5% a person's hemoglobin A1C is, that is a direct reflection of what the average blood sugar has been after the preceding, uh, uh, the preceding 8 to 12 weeks. It's a straight line. So <clears throat> a hemoglobin of A1C of 5 is normal. 6 is pretty good. 7, not so bad. And it goes up to 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, not good. The sugars uh, uh, are too high. So we draw the hemoglobin A1C. It's a blood test. The red blood cell with a low A1C, there's not much sugar stuck to it. A high A1C, there's more. Three months keeps your blood sugar. It's like a glucose footprint. It lets you know, it's a retrospectoscope. <clears throat> you can look over your shoulder and ask the question, 
well, how successful have I been in, t in managing myself? And what we try to do is work with the patient to develop uh, hemoglobin A1C goals to try to reach so that things will be better. What are these goals? We like to get below seven. Five is normal. We're concerned if they're over eight or nine. And if they're over 10, it's really a dangerous situation. The concept is that having a high hemoglobin A1C <clears throat> is sort of like being a glazed donut. Now I know none, since we are in a diabetic setting here, I know none of you have intimate knowledge of glazed donuts, but you might ask your friends and what they look like, they're all just covered with sugar. <clears throat> and when a person has a high hemoglobin A1C, his insides are covered with sugar. <clears throat> and this can have bad effects. And one of the uh, bad effects of chronic high blood sugars in a diabetic is a situation called diabetic neuropathy. Have any of you heard the term diabetic neuropathy? Well, this describes a feeling in the fingers and the toes, usually, of various abnormal things. Numbness, shooting pain, tingling, a burning feeling. <clears throat> and this is a reflection of long-standing hyperglycemia. In other words, a high hemoglobin A1C. In other words, a glazed donut. And the reason that the fingers and the toes are first affected and worst affected is because these nerves are the longest nerves. And if you're going to be a glazed donut, you're going to have a harder time if you're glazed from, uh, from heart to toe and heart to fingertip. There's more reasons for structural damage to occur. One never comes to the doctor's office with diabetic neuropathy and says, doctor, I can't stand it. The tip of my nose is all burning like fire because the nerves aren't long enough. It's the ones that are the longest nerves that, that uh, cause the most suffering. Blood sugar testing, very important. <clears throat> I've just put a, just a brief picture here of the various machines out there that you can purchase or that your doctor will give you to manage your diabetes. Because that's the way we really know how well we're doing. Another uh, technique that's even newer than this is called continuous glucose monitoring. Have any of you heard this term? It's a very important one now there are one company that makes, uh, there's two companies that make this. One is Medtronic. Mm, I can't remember the name of the one that they use. It works with their pump. <clears throat> and the other one is called uh, Dexcom, D-E-X-C-O-M. And what it is, what they both are, is a three-component system. Number one is a thin, a thin little wire-like sensor under the skin that checks the blood sugar continuously. The second component is a transmitter that takes the data, the blood sugar data, and does by Bluetooth to the third component, which is a receiver that tells you what the blood sugar is. And it'll give you the information for what your blood sugar is every five minutes. And it has a low threshold that you set and a high threshold. It, when the low threshold is set and the sugar goes below that point, it vibrates and it makes a noise. A high sugar, uh, it, uh, you set it at perhaps 200, and if it goes above that, it vibrates and makes a noise. And this helps, uh, when a high one helps the patient be in better control of what his blood sugars are. Because it's very difficult to prick, I use this finger advisedly, to prick your finger six or eight or 10 times a day, it becomes very annoying. But if you have this gizmo that does it automatically every five minutes, and it only ha ha has to be calibrated with uh, a finger stick twice a day, uh, that's definitely an advantage. This type of a, of, a, uh, of a companion is especially valuable in people in two groups, parents of diabetic children. My God, what if little Maurice has another hypoglycemic attack in the middle of the night tonight and screams and yells and has a seizure and we have to call 911? If only we could see it coming. Well, you can see it coming. You have the, this Dexcom sensor or the other sensor, and it 
it tells you every five minutes what's going on. And you let the machine know when you want to be notified when it's going too low or too high. So that the mother never has to worry about what's going to happen to little Maurice in the middle of the night. They can just see what the trend is and fix things. And they, and <clears throat> they have a version of it that works with an iPhone. Any of you people have iPhones? I don't either. But for the people that do, you can have an app that will put your glucose level on up to six different iPhones. So the parents can know just what the blood sugar is, which is very valuable with a little kid in the middle of the night. Or a situation called hypoglycemic unawareness, where they don't know when they're starting to get low. They just don't know. Then they just wake up on the floor. Or they wake up with their automobile wrapped around a tree because they couldn't drive properly when their sugars were too low. This can all be avoided with continuous glucose monitoring. And it's something that's new and very exciting. And uh, those of us in endocrine circles are trying to uh, beat the horn and, uh, and blow the horn and beat the drums for this new technology that can make your life easier so that yours, you and your loved ones uh, don't have to, to suffer as much. Again, looking at the A1C and blood glucose levels. Elevated levels we want to avoid. We like to get things down around here whenever we can. Hemoglobin A1C is sort of like a fire alarm to let you know when things are not going right so that you can fix them. And so this is what the, the healthcare team can do. You and the team can work together to figure out a plan <clears throat> to take care of yourself when the sugars are too high so that they won't stay in this uh, dangerous uh, range. So what do we do, those of us that are too stout? Well, we eat a little bit less each meal, move a little more every day. Now, like today, I didn't have a lunch. I had a salad. I, it didn't have much carbs in it. It was delicious. It, had some, it was some Asian concoction. It had chicken on it and some little salad dressing. And it wasn't what I would otherwise get, which would be some big sandwich. Now, this is a, 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 a typical picture of a type 2 diabetic. Many of the type 2s are stout, so he's, he's got religion now and he's trying to uh, exercise at a furious pace to uh, get his weight down and get his sugars better. But the point is, uh, do a little bit each day. When you try to do too much all at once, all at once, you lose heart and, and um, often don't succeed. Baby steps uh, are best. Take your medications. Check your blood sugar. Handle stress. I know I have stress every day. Things don't go my way. And try to do something that's fun. Watch a movie. Read a book. Go dancing or hiking or bowling. Get out of Dodge. Try to do something. And we healthcare providers want to have uh, empathy with you. We realize that diabetes is a job. For some, it's a part-time job. For many, it's a full-time job. And what we like to do with our diabetic teaching is to make a distinction. Now, many of you people that are, are uh, troubled with diabetes are professionals. You're doctors, nurses, teachers, librarians, accountants, um, diabetic professionals. But what we don't want you to become is professional diabetics. The distinction is not to have it monopolize your life. Yes, it has to be part of your life, but through teaching and encouragement, have it not be the be-all and the end-all. There's an anecdote. Years ago, there was a, a, a diabetic child where you have to do a self-portrait. I don't know what grade you're in, third grade or fourth grade or something like this. And it was very poignant. <clears throat> it was a picture of a, you know, a typical uh, seven-year-old self-portrait of the girl in a little frilly dress, blah, 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 and a little happy little smile. But instead of arms and legs, she had insulin syringes because her life was consumed with diabetic management. And uh, watching her food, weighing her food, taking her shots. So she was, rather than on the full path to becoming a diabetic professional, she was falling into the early stage of being a professional diabetic, 
which is uh, uh, not, not healthy. <clears throat> now, the idea of uh, diabetes uh, as a, a part-time job and one in which you have to put in a lot of work to get the desired result, and we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that it's a lot of work, unlike other things. <clears throat> and I use the example of another aging gentleman who decided that he wanted to uh, look like uh, George Clooney. So he doesn't have to do a lot of stuff every day for 35 years of his life, checking his sugar and uh, exercising, doing their rest. He writes a check to the plastic surgeon and he go and, you know, takes his medicines and changes his bandages and goes from this to this. It's a change. But it, it, the, the, um, the contract is less burdensome for the patient. So we acknowledge that you have more to do than, than what this gentleman had to do. Medications. It's best to take them properly. I said uh, take your insulin, <coughs> fast-acting insulin before the meal rather than after, for instance. Rotate your sites. Try not to be discouraged. <coughs> Tell the doctor if you're not taking them. I find that I try to <coughs> elicit conversations with the patient. It makes it a lot easier because we try to give insulin in a certain way. We be very meticulous and take shots before every meal and take a shot at bedtime, then maybe another shot in the morning. You know, we're just writing things on, on paper. But the doctor says, the patient says, you know, I'm depressed. I don't like having diabetes. I feel like dying. I don't take the shot half the time. So that was very valuable for me. I took away the big program that he was taking four shots a day and I changed it to a combination of a, a mixture, a 50-50 mixture of short and long acting that he only had to take twice a day, once before breakfast and once before dinner. And had I not known his despair, I wouldn't have known to give him this simpler course. So be open with, with the doctor, otherwise we just don't know. Now, another thing is the guilt factor, the guilt factor. Needing more medicines, this is not your fault. You assume, I am bad, I am sinful, and that is why I have to take these medicines. Sort of like the doctor being like, I don't know, Jehovah with the long white beard, do better, shame on you. Uh, the moral uh, component for diabetes management is, is often uh, too uh, frequent, frequently used, and it's just not appropriate. The idea, what it does is it makes people guilty, and when you make people guilty, you don't change behavior. You, you, you feel guilty, but you do the same stuff you did before. The idea is to get inside your head and realize, well, um, <clears throat> plan A is not working. Let's work together to think of some alternative that might be more appropriate for you. And don't feel bad when you need more medications. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, diabetes is an ongoing changing of the guard where more and more medications are needed to keep insulin levels where they should be. Because your own ability to make insulin from your pancreas, the pancreas is kind of pooping out as the years go by. It's not your fault, and there are medicines to take care of it. Don't feel bad about it. Don't, let, don't get beat up about it. Don't beat yourself up about it because there are medications that we can give you to help. Medications are your friends. They're designed to help you. And our goal, again, trying to be empathetic, is to use doses that won't make you sick. Different medications for different ways to control your sugar. Taking insulin does not mean uh, the end of the world. I refer you back to Aunt Martha. This is the way Aunt Martha's family saw it. This is the way the woman that I spoke with at 3, 8, 3, 8, 3 p.m. this afternoon saw it. Were she to start insulin at my suggestion, this was her falling off the cliff. And it's not true. Insulin is your friend. The time to use it is earlier in the course when you're just starting to need it before bad things uh, have happened so that you will not have been the glazed donut for six months or a year longer than would have been the case had you started the, the insulin earlier. So this is what's in patients' mind and we just have to try to help them see, see it differently. Check your sugars. Know the blood sugar goals. 
Fasting and before meals, it's ideal if it's uh, less than 130. Some people can't get there easily. Well, if it's less than 150, lightning will not strike you. So that's not so bad. We just always want to work to try to make things better. Don't beat yourself up. Try to do the best that you can, and the health team will uh, support you. Two hours after a meal, the goal, less than 180. Bedtime. Now, this is the, the dark picture that uh, many people with diabetes see, and it just isn't true. I want to give you people optimism and hope. We've looked at the, um, uh, the life expectancy and uh, degree of complications that occur with people every 10 years from the 1950s to the 60s to the 70s, every 10 years thereafter. And each decade, things are getting better and better. And as I said uh, twice before, if we can get your hemoglobin A1Cs in a good place, you can do about as well as anybody else. It is not a death sentence, but it is not easy. It's, um, it's not your fault. People beat themselves up and say, oh my God, I'm 280 pounds and I drink beer and pretzels every day, which isn't so bad if you're seven feet tall, but this unfortunate is five feet three. And, uh, and that's why I have diabetes, I'm awful. Well, there's more to it than personal habits. A lot of people are 280 pounds and five feet three that don't have diabetes. There's some X factor for which you are not responsible. And that is uh, heredity. I tell everybody, as you plan going forward, you have to pick your parents with care. They have to be rich, handsome, slim, and have a long life. But I don't know about you, but that wasn't uh, the cards that I was dealt. And so uh, don't beat yourself up about it. It's not your fault. And don't, don't use the energy of getting up in the morning, every morning, and punching yourself in the nose with self-loathing and self-hatred. Damn it, I have this problem. Damn, damn, damn. That's a lot of exercise there. Change that um, guilt and anger into energy to learn more about the problem that we all have to face. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And that's why I encourage you, and I'm happy to see you here, coming to uh, places and programs like Vitus to learn from the certified diabetes educator and the dietitian about, uh, about what to do to make things better. You have the power. It's not your fault. It's not your, re it's your responsibility. Often there's a weakness to say, what? you're eating that cake, you're eating that cake. See, this moral thing, it's not the moral thing. Everybody has to eat something, and sometimes some people eat cake. You don't have to eat a whole cake. You'd have a little bitty piece of cake or something. Rather than have this wonderfully effective uh, uh, treatment of yesteryear, I guess from my childhood, where we would always write things uh, on the board. I don't know that it changed my behavior any, but there it is. Again, the Jehovah complex. The doctor being in his long, his long white uh, gown and... Uh, you know, sort of like the Nazi opera singer. I'm going to sing and you're going to listen. So the doctor waves his heart, the hand at the patient, sort of like parent-child. The, the, the healthcare professional is the uh, adult and the patient is a seven-year-old. I mean, that's ridiculous. I, I love taking care of patients. I'm a frustrated English major. So when I talk to a patient, it's like reading a short story. Everybody has their own story and their own skill sets and things that, you know, I know nothing about. One fellow was a, a, an engineer. He, he ran a, a railroad, Amtrak. I don't know anything about that. Other people are software engineers. Things I, I don't know anything about. Computer people uh, don't know anything about it. So you must respect the person on the other side of the desk and work together as adults to figure out a strategy to fight the common foe. And don't be like Jehovah there with uh, his flowing garments. Uh, baby steps. Not to, oh my God, oh my God, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. You do, you do it in bite size. You do what you have to do incrementally. So that I, in closing, I want to leave you people 
with a sense of optimism and hope. Information is what you need, and information is what I hope you're, hope you're getting here this evening. And motivation to, to take the, uh, the, uh, the powerful energies of having this problem and turning it into uh, an attempt to learn more about it. And uh, using this analogy of the Titanic, I mean, the person who doesn't have a chance to go to these things say, oh my God, I've got diabetes. I'm here, but in 12 seconds, I'm going to be over here. I'm a dead duck, doc. What's the use? Well, there's lots of use. There's a lot you can do. You can take care of yourself and, and, and do very well. And uh, this is a good picture for other reasons, because let's look here. This is what I'm talking about. What are these people? These people are people that go to the Washington Hospital Diabetes Program. They are learning how to take care of themselves. And who are these people? Who are these people here? These people are the uh, VITA, the, uh, the diabetes educator, the registered nurse, the registered dietitian, dietitian with their broad shoulders rowing the boat towards the warm, blue, safe harbor of better health and a longer life. Diabetes can be managed. Jump on the boat and good luck. Thank you.